Jordan Valley. The Jordan Valley. First Kings chapter 17. First Kings chapter 17. Now, I'm not going to ask you to stand today because it's a long passage in Scripture. In fact, we're going to read the whole chapter before it's over. So, 1 Kings chapter 17. Today we're going to be preaching on the Jordan Valley. Let me share some information with you. The Jordan Valley is known as the Valley of Provision. The Valley of Provision. This valley is located on either side of the Jordan River. It's actually broken into five sections. It is the upper Jordan, the lower Jordan, and the ones in between. It is uh, it's the whole length of the river, and the river runs 136 <coughs> miles from the top of East, uh, Israel all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. The name Jordan translates flowing down. Now keep that in mind. Because we're talking about God's provision. Where does everything that you and I need come from? It comes from God. And it flows down from him. And so there are many biblical references to this valley. Uh, there are so many cities and so many uh, interactions between the nation of Israel and the valley of Jordan. It is rich because of the flood plains and because of the, the natural uh, soil and the, the, protect, uh, the fertile soils, and it's just a rich, rich valley. It's a place of peace. How many of you ever heard an old song that says, Someday I'll cross the river Jordan and I'll enter into the promised land? Uh, the, prop, the, the river Jordan is symbolic of God's provision for our lives. And so today, God's taking me one of my favorite passages of Scripture. In the entire scripture to the story of Elijah and talks about this great man of God and how God made provision for him. And I, I want us to learn today, God makes our provision. Too many times we count on our flesh, our own ability. Anybody in here other than Brother Sam guilty of that? And sometimes I think in my, I take it in my own hands and, and I want to work things out and I want to put my hands on everything. And, and sometimes Brother Sam thinks he can help God. Out. In reality, God doesn't need our help. He needs our faith. Uh, he's the one that makes provision. And so today we're going to look at the story of Elijah and God's provision while he was in the valley of Jordan. So before we do that, let's pray. Father, we come to you grateful and thankful for this day and for everyone that's here today. Father, we pray that the words that you've given and the desire that you placed in my heart and and the meditation that I've had in my mind all week, that, Father, you would bring that to life in us today. That, Father, we would experience you in a powerful way. That, Father, that we'll expand our faith and put our trust and belief in you. Father, we love you. We thank you for everything that you're going to do today. We pray that the Word of God would come alive. That the Spirit of God would use this Word to confront our lives and to bring change. We ask now that the word not come back for you, but it accomplish all the purpose and task which you give it, and that is to change our lives. We love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Beginning in verse 1. And Elijah, the Tishbite, of the inhabitants of Gideon, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, Except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook chair, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook. And I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. And so he went and he did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and he stayed by the brook chair which flows into the Jordan. The raven brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. 
Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Rise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I might drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said to him, As the Lord God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. See, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we might eat and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as you have said. But make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterwards make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and her, so she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Wow, there is a lot there. In this text that we read today, God has given us two encounters in a man's life to reveal to us his provision. The first thing I want you to notice is that in order for us to receive God's provision, there is a condition that you and I must be willing to do. I try to teach y'all. God has his part. But in the relationship, he always gives us a part to do. So it's never just God doing everything and us doing nothing. It is always God doing his part and us doing our part. You and I have a role to play in God's provision. See, many times us Christians just want God to throw it down. Okay. Y'all right? And it's God ought to give it to me because we're four children on it. God is going to give it to me because I'm here. All I have to have, don't have to do anything. That's His love. That's His grace. That's His mercy. He just going to give it to me because I'm His. Sounds like my kids sometimes. <laughs> just get it because I'm yours. And then you want to do it. The truth of the matter is, provision comes with a role that we must play. Look at verse 3 and 4, and then I want to bring it to your attention in verse 9 and 10. Look what it says in verse number 3. Uh, verse number 2, then the Lord, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here, turn eastward, and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you will drink from the brook, and I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. Now, look down to verse number 8. The word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. So in verse 3 and 4, verse 9 and 10, we see God's part. God spoke. Then we see Elijah's part. He just simply did what the Lord said to do. Did you notice that there was a key word that God used both times and both instances in his life? He says, go there. Let me tell you something about God. God is not bound and obligated to make provision for your life in any place that he's not there. Mm. Many times you and I are doing things on our own and we demand God to make provision for it. And the truth of the matter is, God says, I'm only supposed to make provision where I got where I direct, where I put you. He told Elijah, go to the book. What does the Bible say? He went there. He said, there is where I commanded the ravens to feed you. There is where the brook will flow with water. Can I remind you that there is a drought going on? 
God has called down fire from heaven down to Ahab, who's a wicked king, and he told Elijah, You tell Ahab, it's not going to, there's not even going to be any dew on the ground. No water. I bet the people in Houston would have loved some of that. <laughs> <laughs> they said, Man, Lord, you should have done that. Well, now, watch this. There's famine, there's dryness, there's no water, there's a drought. And God commands him, He says, I've got a supply. Mm, I've got the supply. I'm telling you what the supply is. It's at the brook chair. You go there, you go there, and there where I meet your needs. We've got this idea that we can live in our flesh and go anywhere we want to go, do anything we want to do, and God's obligated to make provision while we're there. And the truth of the matter is, you're not supposed to go anywhere that God's not told you to go. You're supposed to live where God says live. You're supposed to work where God says work. You're supposed to play where God says you can play. And if God didn't tell you to go to those places, you ought not be there. And if you're there and then you're calling for God for provision, God says, I'm not obligated because I didn't tell you to go there. <laughs> I learned this early in my ministry. Uh, listening to God, I said, God, I only want to be where you are. And you've heard the story. When I came here to Woodhaven, the work of the street was in the bottom row in this church. Nobody wanted to come here. They struggled to keep pastors. They struggled to have pastors. They were told to close the doors. To turn it over. God was done here. I always found that amazing they wanted to close the door and start a new church. They got it already left. But yeah. <laughs> and I, when I came here, I said, God, I only want to be where you want me to be. I want to be like Elijah. I only want to be there. I want to be where it is that you are. And if you're not there, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be in a thousand member church if he's not there. I don't want to be in a five member church if he's not there. I don't want to be anywhere in my life that he's not there. I don't want to have to say no to ministry. There's some places I'm not supposed to have my hands in. Why? God will make provision there because it's not where I'm supposed to be. Well, Sam, you're just supposed to go. I'm supposed to go where, when, and how my God tells me to go. That's right. Boy, you can learn a lot about life here. Elijah didn't move until God said go. But boy, when God spoke, when God gave a word, Elijah, the great man of faith, knew that if he didn't go there, God wasn't going to provide. So he made sure he went there. Let me share three things with you about God's provision through this great story. By the way, before I go there, here's what the Bible says. I'm going to take a poll. Everybody ready? Everybody get to vote this morning. Don't y'all like that? Now, you Democrats can vote twice. So here it is. <laughs> Watch it. How many of y'all want God's blessings, which is God in his place, in your life? I have got some Methodists in here today, though. Come, Costa. Watch this. Deuteronomy 28, verse number one, here's what God says. God says, if you want my blessings, you're only supposed to do two things. Y'all ready? Two things. Two things. Nobody can get after me. Number one, listen. Listen. What was Elijah called doing here? Listening to God. He didn't move until the voice of God spoke to him and got the word from God. Too many times you and I do things without a word from God. We don't have anything to, to establish our faith on. We're just moving it off of our emotions or, or our intellect or our thoughts, and we're not moving because God says. <coughs> You've got to listen. You've got to know that it's God speaking to you. And, and so he says, listen and obey. Number two is obey. Everybody with me? Okay. Now, what does that mean? That means you do exactly what you hear God tell you to do. So if God tells you to jump, you better jump. Don't worry about asking him how high, just jump. <laughs> oh, well, I, what if he tells you to jump in a crowd of folks? Jump. It don't matter where, when, or how. He says, if you want my best in your life, you must learn to listen and obey what you hear. Now, here's what James chapter 1 says. James 1, chapter 1 says this. All good things come from heaven above. That phrase comes from, translates into the Greek text, originates. From above. So every good and perfect gift you have in your life, you know where it's visible? 
with God. And you know what God wants to do? He wants to move your life into the valley of Jordan. What does Jordan make? Flow down. Is anybody getting a picture? God wants you to camp out and live your life in the, in the valley of Jordan. Where God is the provider of everything you need there. It comes from up above and flows down to you. That's good. I don't care who you are. I mean, he can make it even plainer and clearer than that. Don't move your life outside of the valley of Jordan. Keep it there. Let God tell you where to go, when to go, how to go. Let God tell you what ministry to be involved in, how to direct your family, how to direct your finances, how to direct your health and your wealth. Every aspect of your life, you got to say, God, I want to stay in the valley of Jordan. And in order for me to live there, I've got to listen and obey. Listen and obey. You realize who brought you here this morning is the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. You know that the Holy Ghost, I heard Brother Gary talk about it in Sunday school this morning. You know when the Holy Ghost comes to live in you, he's the voice of God in your life. You've got the ability to hear the voice of God thus say the Lord every day of your life. All you've got to do is be in tune to it. You can't tune them out. You can't let other voices come over and blast him away. You've got to listen to the voice of God. When God says do something, you've got to do it. you got to do it. Well, I love Elijah. He just does what God says. <coughs> he just says, go, he goes. He don't question. It's been, a, it's been one of us who's been, well, God, why have I got to go to the grill chair? Why do you want me to buy a book? Why can't I go to the river? <laughs> There's no way at the river. The little book's just a little stream. How the that going to meet my name? It's going to dry up quicker than the river. I'm going to go to the river. <laughs> and oh, by the way, God, how you going to feed me there? By the way, God, why do you see the rains to do? But you know, God, they're unclean birds. <laughs> Y'all right? Uh, wouldn't we, and by the way, y'all laughing at my little scenario, but how many times do we argue with God in that same mindset? Instead of doing what God said, because he may ask you to do something that's, uh, that's not familiar to you, it's not comfortable, that's not easy, that's going to require you to do it by faith. But even the thing, so even though it's not so, no voice did so. If I was Elijah, I'd be wondering, well, Lord, God will send a stupid bird to feed me. Well, that bird don't listen to me. Lots of bird drops of bread in the brook. I don't like soggy bread, do you? But what if that bird eats some of the bread? I don't eat that bird. Are y'all all right? Why well, should you worry about none of that? He just moved back home. God said, Go to me. God said, Do it, don't. He didn't have to explain it, he didn't even have to understand it. Just do it. Now, let me show you three things about provision. God's provision. Okay. Y'all right. Number one, it can be unusual. In verse 4 and 6, he says, I'm going to put you bread and meat by the brook, by the ravens. Then in, in verse 10, you see that he sent him to a widow. By the way, this is strange and unusual because the man of God teaches the nation of Israel to take care of widows. And so the role should be Elijah providing for the widow, not the widow providing for Elijah. So the roles are turned. It's an unusual command of God. It's an unusual request of God for him to go and the widow take care of him. I think it's unusual if a father drops their food off every morning. By the way, I got a question. Did the birth make the bread? <laughs> Them some smart ravens, they did. Let's get the ravens a little, little credit here. God says, I've prepared the ravens, they're going to bring you bread, they're going to bring you meat. I got another question what kind of meat they drop off? <laughs> Chicken. <laughs> That's a Baptist answer. The biblical answer is probably jail. Like what God said to me in the wilderness, man, I'm from heaven, bread. And, and prayer. Amen? But I'm just back to say, trying to understand that. And I've got a big smile on some of y'all's face. But watch it. I think it would be very unusual for me to go and sit by a group 
and wait for God to bring a big black bird with a big yellow beak and drop off my bread and my meat that And oh, by the way, a brook is just really a stream you can step across. I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about. You, you might call it a creek, but it's not really a creek. It's really more like a ditch. <laughs> y'all right? I suppose it's described as a small place with flowing water. And, and so, I don't know about you, but I don't like drinking out of the ditch. But, but God sent him there. What was God saying to Elijah? Here's what he said. His provisions many times is unusual. Why is it unusual? It can only be recognized as God. How many times have you asked God to give you a provision and you look for it one way? How many of you have ever been financially scrapped? You know what I'm talking about? And you're looking for the check in the mail, are you? <laughs> but then God gives you something unusual, like a second job. Or a third job. Or maybe God increases your first job and you're working some overtime and, and, and you're praying and the whole time you're praying and saying, God, I'm taking you in your performance freedom and you got to help me out first. you got to do it, you got to do it, you got to do it. I says, okay. It's going to be an unusual thing. Unusual thing. You didn't ask for the overtime, guess who gets to? You didn't ask for the second job or God just opened the door. You weren't looking for a third job, but you might just gave it to you. Especially in a day and time when people were doing without work. And it seems like you can't get away from work. That's a little unleashed in this time. I've had a lot of those moments where God just sent money to the bank. I put a check. I've walked out my mailbox a hundred times and seen God put a check in there for me. I've had people, you've heard this story, some of you've heard this story, Nick and I, when I first got called into ministry, man, I was so excited. Uh, Isaiah 6, uh, when Isaiah said, who, uh, God said, who shall I send? And Isaiah said, thank God, thank God. When I got, when I surrendered the call of God, that's all I did. I just took my hands up and said, thank God, thank God, just send me God. Just take me where you want me to go. And then God began to move my life and send me to Mexico and send me to other places and put me in jail ministry for there. And I brought someone to preach the inmates. And then I went to nursing homes. And, and I just preached on the any time God gave me an opportunity. I preach on the street. And God just said, I want you to back. I want you to learn the first thing out of the back, out of the cave, for example. You need to learn that I am your provider. It's not a church. It's not a group of people. It's me. Amen. He fired me from the only job I ever had from the time I was in high school until I until he found me. Just walk in one day, Paul said, Hey, both of us doing the same job, both of us got to go. Bye bye. <laughs> the only reason he did that is because could, I couldn't stay in that job because I never trusted God. I never would have followed God with complete fullness until God got me out of the place. So I wouldn't leave and go to the chair if God sent me to <laughs> You know, I'm like, just fire. Now you're going to the book. <laughs> Y'all right? <laughs> went to Mexico. I got fired. I went to Mexico. And they said, How are you going to play? I said, God, yeah. Next thing you know, my trip to Mexico. Go to Mexico. Go on a mission trip. Come back. Don't have a job. Got a baby that's, that's lost her hearing, been sick. Don't have any insurance. Don't have any job. Don't have anything. We got right? The severance check they gave me, we paid our rent, paid all our utilities, paid everything up for a month. We had about not much. <laughs> five bucks. You remember five dollars. That's why I said not much. But we went to a, a, a church meeting on Sunday night. God said, share the testimony. Share what God's doing in your life. And then when they passed off and played, God told me at the same time he told her, put everything you had in that plate. She emptied out, I emptied out. She didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what she was doing. We put it in the plate. We put it in the God. At that time, got in the car. We're driving home, and she said, Boy, the Lord spoke to me. I said, What did he say? He told me to empty out and give it all. I said, Well, he told me something. So now I don't. We ain't got money to buy food and diapers for a baby. <laughs> we just started praising the Lord. We're going to trust the Lord. What happened to you? That's what the preacher walked up to me, hugged my neck, gave me an envelope, and I just put it in my coat pocket. 
We drive down the road just worship and praise the Lord, had a great service, great time, but worried about what was going to happen. And about halfway home, they said, well, What that preacher give you? I said, I don't know. He gave me the envelope, I put it in my pocket. I don't ever open any of <laughs> She said, you mind if I open? I said, no, get it out. She reached back, I got the envelope, pulled it out. Claimed the six one hundred dollars. Got here and answered me. Okay. I knew she was going to go back. <laughs> all I know is this. He said, give all, we gave all, and he multiplied. So watch it. When you lay with God, He'll meet your need in unusual ways. Don't always look at trying to figure out what you need. When Becky lost her hearing, we needed a couple of airplanes. We, you heard this story. We, we prayed, and, and I told them, I said, I believe God will take care of it. They started quoting all the prices for the hospital stay and the surgery and then the device itself, and she was overwhelmed. I kept saying, honey, it's going to be all right. God's got this, God's got this, God's got this. And we just started believing that together. God's got it. God's got it. God's got it. Went and had the surgery, and she got the cochlear implant. And when we went to get the bill, we were told it was paid in full. Amen. Well, don't you want to know who did it? I know who did it. It's God. Well, you don't want to know the person? I don't need to know the person. I know the person. It's God. What are you trying to say, Brother Sam? You're trying to figure out how to fix you, and the only person who can fix you and make provision for your life is God. Amen. And if you're thinking God can only move in certain matters in certain ways, that's not faith. That's not faith. Faith is believing in something even though it's not something, so God makes it something. It's unusual. Watch this, verse 7. God's provision is timely. Now, I don't think you don't use it. That time it was in verse number seven. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. God already knew the brook would dry up. And then he gave commands to go to the place necessary for the next provision. He is always on time for what we need. See, our God is sovereign, He knows everything in advance. He knows what we need, when we need it, how we need it. He knows when you need something unusual to expand your faith. I'm really convinced that the average Christian has average faith because we're not looking for miracles. We're not looking for unusual things. We're not looking just for God answers. We're trying to figure everything out. And if it's not on our time when we think it ought to be happening, we take care of it ourselves. Instead of waiting on God. He's on time every time. It's a southern gospel song they sing about that. God's provisions are always timely. Now watch this. They're always on time if I move my life as needed. Can you stay in a place too long? Yes. Can you leave a place too soon? Yes. So is it God's fault if you stay too long and you missed a provision because you wouldn't go there? Is it God's fault if you go too soon and the provision is not paid? See, here's the thing about provision. If God is going to meet a need in my life, he may meet it through somebody else. But somebody else might need a little more work done to them before I need it. Yeah. If I leave it too quick, I might Miss it because they're not ready. Well, if I wait on God until it's completely dried up, and God said, now go to Zarephath. Now go. The will is ready now to meet your need. That's the hardest thing to learn in this. I don't know if I've shared this. I probably have. If I have, y'all forgive me. When we we're in our heyday before Katrina and we were growing and almost in two services and making provisions and account. I had two churches contact me and wanted me to leave and come to their church. Boy, I tell you, one of them was very tempting. Y'all right? Uh, just big, bigger than this and, and had a lot more 
opportunities and stuff. And man, when they called and said, hey, we want you to come. We'll meet you. I began to pray, saying, and I said, Lord, I pray. Man, I know you're here. <laughs> I only know, I know you're here. I began to pray, and God said, I'm not done with you. It's not time for you to leave here. You know how many preachers make mistakes leaving and going somewhere else because they see? Anybody ever seen green grass on the other side? Yes. I mean, y'all, you know, sometimes that green grass is important and bitter. And so, and so, I mean, I had to pray and say, God, I, am I done yet? Am I finished yet? Hey, by the way, the same thing happens when ministries decline or plateau. Your preacher's done, God's done. You know how many church members do that? Sunday school plateau from five to one. I'm not supposed to teach you anymore. I'm ready to do something new and fresh. I'm done. Many times we need to make sure that our lives are in tune with the timing of God. You better not move a minute too early or a minute too late. You better make sure that you're in His time because when you're in His time, He's very timely. He's always making His provision on His time. He is on time every time, and I gotta make sure that I'm in His time. I'm in His time. Not running ahead of him, not waiting too late. Well, Sam, is it possible to live like this? Yes. If you like living in the valley of joy, yeah. uh, you just won't stay there. You got trust. I mean, this is a life. Listen, this life I'm talking about is a life lived by faith. I'm not talking about just living life because. Somebody said it. Now, it's hard to stay still when God says stay still. Sometimes it's hard to leave when God says leave. We were at a former church in Atlanta. Many of you know this. We started that church with 12 people when pastors home. And when we left, when, when God told me I was done, over 250 people blowing like crazy doing two services. And man, I just... Man, God was usually brought there. I've seen people saved and baptized with people. And then God said, Sam, it's time for you to leave. I was like, what? <laughs> Why do you want to leave when things are going so well? What am I doing wrong? I thought, hey, did God see it? God said, no, you've not seen it. It's time for you to leave here because I'm about to drive your breath up. And he sent me to where they Man. What the brook? <laughs> I'm like, God, you might dig a ditch here, amen. <laughs> but listen, I'm convinced if I would stay one more year longer than I'm supposed to, I would have become trouble with that church. When we left that church, it was the sweetest family. That church continued to pay for my education. They moved me down here. They paid to move me down here. Listen. Normally when a pastor resigns or a staff member resigns, they give you a little card, thank you, bye-bye. They continue to invest in my life. They continue to pour into our lives. They continue to ask me back. And every time I come preach, they give me a great big honorarium. That's money. <laughs> to a young preacher that's living and trying to go to school and raise a family and trying to find a church, that God knew what I needed. And he used that church and provided that church to take care of me. And they did that with a loving heart, with no regrets, no strings attached. Why? Because I left in God's timing. Well, if I stayed, what would have happened? Me and the pastor could have got fighting. A staff fight. Y'all have heard of churches having staff fight? Not here. We're all in youth. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's that. Amen. <laughs> I make reference to the unity, y'all. Amen. You must be out there. Y'all missed it. Y'all weren't paying attention or something. <laughs> you ever seen a vision in the church? Sometimes that's a result of not being obedient to God's time. You want God's provision in the valley of Jordan. You gotta be on his time. 
and you're going to stay in his time. Now look at the last one, and I'll be done. What is the grace? Look at this. Not only is God's provisions unusual and timely, look at this. They're sustained. They're sustained. Look, this second story about uh, Elijah and the widow. Either Elijah is the selfish, <coughs> selfish, most selfish prophet in the scripture, or he trusts in the sovereignty of his God. Think about it. Here's the man of God going to a widow. Did you read what she said? She said, Hey, when you come through today, hey, I, I'll get you a cup of water, by the way, when there's no water, a cup of water is a big thing. Now, here's a mother. She's a widow. She has a son. And here she is. She's got a little bit of flour left, a little bit of water left, a little bit of oil left. Here was her plan. I got just enough left that me and my son can drink this water, eat this bread, and then we're going to prepare to die. But that's it. There is no more provision. I'm out. And here's the man of God walk up to tell you what, here's what you need to do. Give me your last cup of water and give me your last piece of bread. <clears throat> he's either selfish or he knows he's God to be sovereign. I think he learned that when God brought the ravens to bring the meat and the bread. And so, you know what the Bible says she did? So she did as the man of God said to do. Boy, the people that just didn't have the man of God said to do. Just do. As a result of that, look what the Bible says. The Bible says that every day, for many days. Can I tell you how many days it was? Many theologians in James chapter 5 verse 17. James says that we need to pray like Elijah because Elijah prayed and said that it would not have land on, rain on the land for three and a half years. Many theologians that I looked at this passage believe that the first six months he stayed by the brook chair. And that's what God told him to be in time all the time to trust and faith in the sovereign God to believe in that God. And then when the brook church, once he got accomplished what he needed to at the brook, he moved into the well. And there he not only met Elijah's need, but he met the need of the widow and her son for three years. That's many days. I got a question. The scripture says every time she went to that band to get flour, there was just enough flour in there to make food for her or her son and for the bride. There was enough, or enough, enough flour when she went to the band. Who kept filling that band up every day? Did he give her more than she needed, or did he give her exactly what she needed? Now, watch this. Does God give you and I exactly what we need? Can I teach you a principle here about God's sustaining us? God don't have to give you more. If he gives you more than you need, it's because he wants you to be like Elijah and share the abundance of what you got with somebody else. <laughs> Let that sit for me. How many of you feel like you're blessed far more than you deserve? Yeah. And you know who gave you the blessing, right? Yes, sir. You know who sustains you, who makes sure you've got food and eat in the house and stay and all that stuff. It's all God. So everything that we have above that is more than what we need to sustain us. What is our tendency when God gives us more? To hoard it up. All right. I bet if we went to your closet right now, I know in my closet I got stuff that I ain't worn you. Y'all right? What's going to do with that? I'm going to pick the dress off there. <laughs> How many of y'all want to dump that? Well, I'm slaving so I don't have a yard sale. <laughs> yard sales are from there. I'm not just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> And then you never had the yard set. Yeah. Then you end up owing it a lot. Does God intend for us to live our life under His sustaining power? Yes. 
Then why are we so worried about building up and storing up? When in this example we see that the woman had just enough. In time, all the time, we, we live our lives consumed. A lot of David Black says in his book uh, that, that we're consumed with the American way. That we're consumed with the American dream. That we're living our lives and what we do as Christians, we pull Jesus into that American dream. And we say that Jesus is the Jesus of blessing. He gives me more than I need so that I can store it up or keep it for myself. So that I can be prestigious and powerful here on earth. Did you know that many Christians are in bondage to financial problems because they're living in places that they can't, the Lord don't intend for them to sustain? <laughs> Y'all right. Living lifestyle. I gotta have a certain car, a certain make, a certain beauty. Man, I just want one run, baby. Amen. <laughs> Mine's paid for. God's given us a chariot mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> and he's gonna keep it running for me. <laughs> Wait, and I, I, do I want a new one? What they nice to run down there and get a new one, amen? Yeah. Until they want that piece of paper, I said you pay me $500 a month yeah. for the next 72 months. How many y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, I sure look good right in the new one. <laughs> Style and profile. <laughs> y'all right? Or oh, I can just keep the chair that God, God's given me and sustain it, keep it, keep it running, be responsible, or I can get in debt. I got a nice house. We bought that house, a little Jim Walker house with much to it. But boy, God sure has built it and changed it and expanded it and, and met our needs in that house. Would I like a new one? Yeah. One with steel or brick where I don't have to paint. <laughs> I mean, y'all don't know that. A small yard where I can do it in 20 minutes instead of two and a half hours. <laughs> One where everything's easy to get to? What are you saying, Brother Sam? God's, God's sustain is to meet our need. If God gives us more, he needs to use us as a vehicle to give to others. God wants to use the extra that he gives you to bless or to provide for somebody else. Why do you think the scripture makes it very clear that it's greater to give than it is to receive? If I'm living in the Valley of Georgia and I've got more than I need in the Valley of Georgia, there's going to be somebody that's trying to get into the Valley that needs to take some of my stuff. Y'all know? Right. Y'all heard me pray early when we prayed about Houston. You do know that the Lord's going to give us an opportunity to give. Uh, the Lord's going to give us an opportunity to take what we have in abundance and to, and to be the vehicle by which He works. To sustain you, to give somebody what they need in times of sorrow and trouble. By the way, this is more than just fleshly things. Food, cars, houses, clothes, all that stuff. What about spiritual? How many of you have been to the River Jordan and got filled up with spiritual blessings from God? Yeah. I mean, God's poured into your life and poured into your life and poured into your life. You've got teaching after teaching, encouragement after encouragement, and yet you never share what God has sustained you. You hold me up. You keep it for a rainy day. Instead of just giving it out. Uh, many of y'all know my son Jonathan. Uh, the, his football team last week had a tragedy. They had a football player that passed out and, and, and died in the field during their practice. And it was a very traumatic thing, a bunch of 19, 18, 19 year old kids to see that happen. And to see it, see death firsthand in that manner is very traumatic and shocking. And, and so they trying to get the kids to counseling and ministers and all that. And, and John told them, said, Daddy, they, they made all the staff, the coaches, they had to go to a counselor and they had to share their feelings and their thoughts. And, and it upset Jonathan. I'll, I'll tell you, it upset Jonathan. But he, he called me and his mom and we prayed with him, prayed for him, and we had others that were praying for him, and, and this church was praying for him, and, and he was upset that then that happened on Monday on Tuesday when they had that staff thing, and I was so proud of him. When he got in there, the coach said, Jonathan, we need to know what, how you're feeling. 
He just stood up and said, you need to understand, I'm different than everybody in this room. I come from a home of faith. I come from a Christian home. My daddy was a pastor. We've had to deal with death in a church setting. We've had to deal with death in our community. I've seen my dad. When we had a high school player in Ocean Springs. Got killed at the railroad tracks many years ago. And God used us to minister to the school and minister to those kids. My son has seen firsthand how God deals in ministry with hope and with, with faith and with love through this church and through his life and said, I can go through this because I believe in a God that gives life and takes life. It's all in his hand. God is my encouragement. Yeah. Yeah. You know what he was doing? He was giving what he got out of the Valley of Georgia. He was giving to those who didn't have. Yeah. <clears throat> mm. Now, did he want to be there? No. Did he want to be in that situation? Did he want to have? No. But you know what? There's a lot of times you and I, through God taking us to the Valley of Jordan, we receive so much from God. And sometimes our life is the life he wants to use to show somebody else to the back. To give somebody hope and encouragement, provision in the back. We should be writing about what we've done. Y'all are not. I'll come. I do. I deserve it. Instead of saying, wait a minute, everything I got came from God. Anything I have is His. Everything I have is His. I'm just a steward of it. I'm just taking care of it while I'm here on earth. And, and I'm going to get If God tells me to give it, I'm getting it. If God says get rid of it, I'm getting rid of it. If God says I'm, I'm in His time, I'm in His provision, He's going to make sure I've always got enough so He can use me to give it to somebody else so I'm not going to worry about it. Amen. Just go get it. Because I believe in the God of provision. I know my God provides. It's unusual at times, but it's always time and it's always sustained. I want to ask you questions now. Anybody in here justify that you've been in the valley of Jordan? You ever been in that valley? You ever had God sustain you when you're unsustainable and you just couldn't figure out why is God doing this? How, how is he? I just don't understand. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in the valley of Jordan? He decided to hmm. Now it's okay to leave if God's doing the leave. Amen. It's okay to leave when God says it. He might take his mouth. Oh, Lord, he it's okay to leave when God says it. But if you left on your own, and now you're in trouble. And you're begging God to provide, provide, provide. You know what you need to do? Everybody look at this way. You need to repent, repent, repent. And move your life back over to the God of provision. And you stay until he says move. You don't give till he says give. You don't go till he says go. You need to move your life back to a life of trusting through obedience and faith in your device. That's what you need to do. That's what we need to say. Until he says go to Sarah. Let me ask you a question. Are you there? Is God making all your provision? Is God doing great work in your life? Can you hear the right voice of God? Are you there? Are you in the valley? Would every head bow my Father, I pray in Jesus' name that in the stillness of the next few moments that your spirit will search our hearts. See, Father, if we've moved outside of your will, see if we've moved outside of your provision, are we there? Are we in the right place with the God's provision? Are we in the battle of joy? If not, Father, I pray that we confess, that we repent, that we turn our lives and return to that battle. A valley where we place our faith and our trust in you. 
And Father, we don't move to the left or the right, and we stay right with you by the brook. Or Father, we move from the brook where it is you want us to go. But Father, we don't do anything without you. So right now, Father, would you speak to hearts and would you change lives? We love you and we ask you to do great things now in Jesus' name. Every head and bowed eyes closed. As our music begins to play, God spoke to your heart, you need to make a decision. Maybe you're not there. Maybe you're not in a place where God can continue to make provision. As our music plays, will you come? You're just one confession and repentance away of being there. Would you come?